Hello everyone. In this presentation, I'll talk about how to make locks lock-free. At first, this may sound like a contradictory statement, but throughout the presentation, I'll show that it's not only possible, but also possible to do efficiently. This is joint work with my collaborators, Nama Ben David from VMware and my advisor, Guy Blalock from Carnegie Mellon University. So fast and scalable uh, concurrent data structures are very important. They are used in operating systems, database systems, and many other applications. For this reason, many lock-based and lock-free data structures have been developed, such as MassTree, LazyList, SnapTree, uh, and so on, which use fine-grained locks. And on the lock-free side, there is Michael, Michael Scott's Q, uh, Harris's linked list, and many, many more. So people usually think of lock-based and lock-free data structures as two separate categories, but they are actually not opposites of each other. Uh, lock-free basically means that processes can't block each other from making progress. And on the other hand, locking provides the abstraction that there's only one process executing a critical section at a time. And these don't contradict each other. So the diagram should look something like this. Um, although most algorithms, including the ones listed on uh, this slide, lie squarely on one side uh, or the other. So lock-free data structures have certain advantages, such as guaranteeing progress in worst case executions, uh, robustness to slow or crashed threads, and in practice, they achieve better throughput in oversubscribed situations where you have more processes than processors. Um, however, lock-free data structures are significantly more difficult to design compared to lock-based ones, and their correctness proofs tend to be very, uh, very subtle. So the question is, what if we can program with the familiar interface of locks, but run the program in a lock-free manner and have all the advantages of both sides? And uh, as I said on my first slide, we saw that this is not only possible in practice, but also possible to do efficiently. So to do this, we implement something called a lock-free lock. So this is different from traditional locks, where in this example, if P1 holds a lock, then P2 has to wait for P1 to release before it can grab the lock. Instead, lock-free locks uh, store a descriptor object describing P1's critical section. Then if P1, P2 wants the lock, it uses this descriptor to help complete P1's critical section and release the lock on P1's behalf. Then P2 can write its own descriptor and proceed with its own operation. So the benefit of this is that if P1 gets interrupted or descheduled while it is holding a lock, then another process can still make progress without having to wait for P1 to be scheduled again. And we see from our, our experiments that this makes a big difference in certain workloads. So the key challenge is uh, when implementing lock-free locks is uh, executing the descriptors ad impotently. Uh, this is because the same descriptor could get executed once by the original process and many more times by processes trying to help it. And uh, ad impotence basically just means that no matter how many times uh, it gets executed, uh, it should appear to only happen once. And in this setting, the repeated executions can even be concurrent with each other. So we have to make sure to handle this uh, safely as well. So um, idempotence is the key property uh, for safe helping. So these high-level ideas behind lock-free locks were first proposed by Turek, Sasha, and Prakas, and also independently by Barnes in the 1990s. However, their technique for ensuring idempotence uh, is widely considered to be impractical, and it, it involves writing out the program counter and all the local variables after uh, each uh, load and store. Uh, this adds a lot of overhead, even when uh, no helping occurs. Uh, and as far as we know, there's no uh, available implementation of these techniques, and it seems hard to do without a special purpose compiler. So the main contribution of our paper is a practical algorithm for lock-free locks, which uses a new way of ensuring idempotence. Uh, we develop a C++ library called Flock based on these ideas, which is purely library based and requires no uh, compiler support. A nice feature of this library is that you can toggle between uh, using lock-free locks and using traditional locks at runtime by just flipping a switch. 
And this means that by writing a, a data structure once, you get both a lock-free version and a blocking version. Uh, we experimentally compared these two and found that the lock-free version is up to 2.4 times faster than, uh, than the blocking version in oversubscribed situations. And without oversubscription, the two are about the same. We also compared the lock-free version with uh, state-of-the-art uh, lock-free data structures and found that they were, it was competitive, uh, they were competitive. So the library we implement provides two main functions, with lock and try lock. Uh, for both functions, you pass in a lock and, a, and also a thunk to run while holding the lock. A thunk is basically just a function without any arguments. And requiring the, the, um, requiring the critical section to be wrapped in a thunk uh, is very useful for, for our implementation. So the difference between th these two methods is that uh, with lock is guaranteed to uh, successfully run the thunk before returning, uh, whereas try lock is allowed to fail and return false if it sees that the lock has already been taken. Uh, try lock is more flexible because it lets the user decide what to do if there's a contention on the lock. For example, you can either try, uh, you can either decide to try again or move on to a different operation or add some back off before trying again. And note that you can always implement with lock by just putting try lock in a loop. So in this presentation, we'll focus on uh, implementing try lock. To ensure lock freedom, try lock still has to help. Uh, and this is because otherwise, the next time you do the try lock, you might get blocked by the same uh, operation again, which would, uh, which would not be lock free. Uh, so an important feature of our library is that it also supports nested locks. And this means that the thunk that you pass in uh, can have recursive calls to with lock or try lock. Uh, however, just like for standard locking, you have to watch out for deadlocks. And this would manifest itself as helping cycles in our lock-free implementation. Uh, so to see a concrete example, this is how you would implement a lock-free doubly linked list using our library. So the details of the code are not, are not important, but the main takeaway is that it looks, like, it looks a lot like how you would use uh, normal locks. So the calls to the library are highlighted in, are highlighted in orange in the pseudocode. Uh, the doubly linked list here uses a technique called optimistic locking, which dates back to Kung and Lehman uh, back in the 1980s. So the idea is to first traverse the, the list without taking any locks and then only lock the neighborhood of nodes that you wish to modify. Uh, this is usually much faster than hand over hand locking or locking entire paths. Uh, and in general, combining our library with optimistic, lock, uh, with optimistic locking gives you simple and efficient lock-free data structures. And we picked the doubly linked list as an example here because lock-free algorithms for it tend to be, tend to be very complicated. Uh, and the one we show here is a lot simpler. Uh, so the critical section is highlighted in blue and it corresponds to the try lock on the previous line. Inside the critical section, we can read from shared variables, uh, write to shared variables, allocate memory and free memory and do all the usual operations. Uh, but you need to make sure that the shared variables are wrapped in this mutable type. And we will explain what this does uh, in more detail in later slides. Uh, so now we'll talk about the details of our algorithm, starting uh, with how we ensure idempotence. Uh, so we begin by making the code ABA free, uh, meaning that the same value should never be written to the same memory location twice. In general, this can be done by tagging each location with a counter, uh, in our but our library uses a more optimized version of this that avoids double wide comparing swap. Uh, to make thunks idempotent, we use a shared log and basically the log helps processes agree on the result of each shared memory operation. Uh, so this approach works best for fine-grained locks where the critical sections are small. It would still be correct on larger critical sections, uh, but we didn't evaluate this in our experiments. So let's see an example to make this approach more concrete. Uh, suppose we want to make the thunk T idempotent. The code for T is fairly simple. It checks if a.next points to b, and if it does, then it shortcuts b uh, out of the linked list. Uh, so first we initialize all the log entries to bottom, and we always update the log with a, with a compare and swap from bottom to the desired value. 
uh, if another process has already updated that location, then the compare and swap will fail. Uh, so, uh, and to execute the dunk, uh, each process maintains a pointer to the current instruction and also a pointer to the current location in the log. Uh, so to execute line one, P1 first reads a.next and, and writes that value to the log. This helps ensure that if a, a helping process re-executes this load in the future, it will still see the same value. And then P1 enters the if statement and does the same thing for the second load. Uh, next for the store, store operation, we start by committing the current value uh, of a.next and then do a compare and swap, changing a.next from this committed value uh, to the new value C. Uh, the purpose of logging is so that all processes will execute the exact same compare and swap when they reach this line. Uh, and, and only one copy of this compare and swap can succeed because of the ABA free property uh, we discussed earlier. And this prevents uh, a store from happening twice. So now let's say P1 pauses at this point and another process P2 starts executing the dunk. Uh, for the first two load operations, P2 will just use the values from the log. Uh, and this is, this is important because it means that P2 will follow the exact same branches as P1, even though the state of memory has already changed. Now for the store operation, uh, P2 sees that a.next uh, no long, is no longer equal to uh, whatever is stored in the log. So it concludes that the store has already happened and it doesn't have to do anything. Uh, now P2 overtakes P1 and starts executing the retire. Uh, retire is basically used for memory management. It delays freeing a node until no other process can be accessing it. And uh, to make sure retire only gets called once, we use the log to determine which process is responsible for it. Uh, and now uh, finally for the allocate operation, uh, each process first allocates the memory locally and then use, uses the log to agree on whose memory to use. Um, so that's the high level algorithm and you can make any thunk item potent by just replacing all the shared memory operations uh, with these uh, variants that commit to the log. So going back to the doubly linked list example, um, ensuring item potence is done by uh, wrapping the shared variables in the mutable type. Uh, whenever you do a load and store, it automatically determines if you are in a critical section. Uh, if so, uh, the write, uh, it writes to the log as described previously, and otherwise the loads and stores are just primitive instructions with no, uh, with no overhead. Uh, the load and store interface provided by the mutable type is exactly the same as the one for uh, C++ Atomics, so it's easy to use. Uh, although with one exception, one, one uh, instruction that you can't do in a critical section is compare and swap. However, we do support compare and modify, uh, which is the same thing except with no return value. Uh, it turns out that compare and modify is easier to make item potent than compare and swap, and we will need it to implement trilog. So in our experiments, we see that the overhead of uh, committing to the log is, uh, is usually not bad. And this is because the logs are short and most of the writes uh, to it are cast hits. Uh, helping, causes helping can add contention to the log, uh, which degrades the cast performance. So we had to come up with some optimizations for avoiding this. And this is basically how our item potence technique works. Uh, next, I'll talk about the try lock algorithm. At a high level, uh, each lock stores a pointer to a descriptor, and each descriptor stores a pointer to a log and also a pointer to a dunk. Uh, so the try lock starts by doing a compare and swap, changing the uh, lock from uh, null to the new descriptor. And if it succeeds, it runs this new descriptor and returns true. And if it fails, it performs helping and returns false. Now, the tricky part is supporting a structure that looks like this with nested try locks. And the key observation is that you just have to implement trilock with the item potent primitives discussed earlier, and this would give you nesting for free. Uh, however, this requires change, changing the algorithm a little bit. Uh, so recall that we don't support item potent compare and swap. So we have to replace this with uh, a compare and modify followed by a load. Uh, these two operations are not atomic, which introduces a subtle uh, complication. Uh, suppose you succeed on the compare and modif uh, suppose you succeed on a compare and modify, uh, but be but before you do the load, another process has helped you and changed the lock to point to something else. 
um, after you wake up, you might think that your compare and modify has failed, even though it succeeded. Uh, and to fix this problem, we add a done flag to the descriptor object. And uh, you can check this done flag to see if uh, someone else has already helped in between these two uh, instructions. Um, so overall, uh, th this is a simplification of how our uh, algorithm actually works, um, but it serves to capture the, the main ideas. Uh, so for our C++ implementation, uh, we applied many uh, optimizations and extensions beyond these ideas. So for example, um, we, so this includes uh, support for arbitrary link logs and also optimizations for immutable and update once variables, uh, which are very common in, in concurrent data structures. Uh, so th these are described in more detail in our paper. Uh, for memory management, we used APOC-based reclamation uh, but you could use any other technique here as well. Uh, so for our experimental evaluation, our goal was to first compare lock-free locks uh, with blocking locks, and then to compare them with hand-designed uh, lock-free data structures. Uh, we applied our library to linked list, uh, binary search trees, B trees, hash tables, and also an index data structure called uh, adaptive redex tree, which is very popular in the database community. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first lock-free implementation of the adaptive Redux tree. And, but for this presentation, I'll focus on our linked list experiments. And the patterns that we see here can be found in the other data structures as well. So there are three types of linked lists we ran. Uh, the lazy list essentially uses optimistic locking uh, to implement a singly linked list. Uh, we also have uh, dlist, which is the doubly linked list example from before. And finally, we compare with Harris's uh, lock-free singly linked list. For lazy list and dlist, we have uh, both a lock-free and a blocking version, which are represented with the LF and BL uh, suffixes, respectively. Uh, so here's a graph showing the scalability of these data structures. Uh, we initialized each list with 100 keys uh, and ran a workload with 5% updates and 95% uh, lookups. The dotted vertical line represents the number of processors on our machine. So everything to the right uh, is oversubscribed. Uh, so comparing the lazy list, um, comparing the lock-free lazy list with the blocking version, we see that they are almost, almost the exact same up until oversubscription. And then the, uh, the lock-free version becomes more than two times faster. And this is because of the effect that we discussed earlier where one process could take a lock and then go to sleep. A similar effect happens for the doubly linked list, uh, which is represented by the two orange lines. Uh, so now let's look at uh, Harris's linked list. The difference between Harris list and Harris list op is that the latter does not perform helping when doing updates. And we see from the graph that this perform uh, improves performance slightly. Uh, if we perform uh, lazy, if we compare lazy list using lock free locks with Harris's list, we see that there's a gap of about 16%. And this is because Harris's linked list uses a more efficient method of helping uh, that's specifically designed for a linked list. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we presented a new algorithm for idempotence and lock-free locks, uh, which is practical and more efficient than previous approaches. Uh, we packaged it into a C++ library, uh, which can be found in our GitHub repository. And this library allows you to uh, implement simple and efficient uh, lock-free data structures. It also uh, lets you get both a lock base and lock free version by just writing the program once. And you can pick whichever one is more uh, suitable for your application. Uh, so that's the end of this presentation and thank you for listening.